to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning in. Phil Tarrant here, editor of Smart Property Investment. Joined today by uh, Jim Hall. Jim is the... Uh, he heads up uh, mortgages and real estate here at Momentum Media. Uh, Jimbo, thanks for coming along, mate. No problem. Been a while since I've been on the show. So it is. We've let you back. You might remember uh, uh, we actually had Jim on really early days in the show as uh, an investor, so as well as his day job being Mr. Man in the media of uh, real estate and mortgages in Australia. Uh, Jimbo's got a, a nice, sizable property portfolio. So uh, meeting him often. Uh, share our stories just uh, you know, over a beer about uh, where we're buying, how we're buying. So I thought Jim would be a good... Good uh, special co-host with me today to uh, to have a chat with Robert Skeen. Rob's from Skeen Property Buyers. Uh, Rob, thanks for joining us, mate. So you're a buyer's agent, mate. How long have you been in the game for? Uh, I came up to 16 years as a buyer's agent. Okay, 16 years. All right, so you kicked off around 2000, yeah? How many buyer's agents, quote, end quote, were around at that time? Oh, look, there were very few. Uh, I think probably you could count the, the amount of buyer's agents on one hand back in those days. Nowadays, I think if you look at uh, Rebo, they're probably, that's the Real Estate Buyers Agent Association, you've probably got about 70 across Sydney. Did you call yourself a buyer's agent back in 2000? Yeah, absolutely. I think with the market, the way that it was then, it was certainly gaining momentum. A lot of buyers around, there was a lot of money around with the Liberal government and power, you know, globalisation and I think back then it was more luxury to, to have a buyer's agent and people love to say we've got a buyer's agent going out there doing all the work for us. Um, but yeah, the market was competitive then too, and people needed needed our help because they were missing out. They weren't, were unsure of values, time poor. So all the reasons why people need a buyer's agent back in 2000 are pretty much all the same reasons why people need a buyer's agent today in 2016. Absolutely, yeah. We take two ways with this podcast, and we obviously like getting investors on and chatting about their portfolios, um, and I think we'll do that at some point in time with you. But what I really wanted to chat to you today about is um, just really negotiation. So you've been doing... You've been buying property for people for 16 years, so you probably know every trick in the book. Oh, not everything, but I try. <laughs> I've, <laughs> actually, I've seen, seen and heard it all. <laughs> I actually asked Rob to come along today with a briefcase full of his magic tricks and uh, his secrets on how best to uh, how best, how best to get the best properties um, from, from agents. But um, let, let's concentrate on, on this today, sort of negotiation. Also, the um, just, just the buying process. You know, I've bought... I've bought quite a few properties. I've got a reasonable portfolio and we talk about it on the show, which is good. I use a buyer's agent myself. I'm a big fan of buyer's agent. All those reasons why you said back in 2000, buyer's agent, that's the reason why I do it today. I'm time poor. Um, buyer's agent can do it much better than I can. they 100% committed to understanding markets and processes and stuff. So I'm happy to pay a fee for them to do it for me. Some of the best money I spend. Um, and I've reaped re re rewards as a result of it. Jimbo, you probably testament to that. I well. have, yeah. I've uh, used a buyer's agent for every every one of my investment properties. Not for my own home, actually, but... Um, That's probably... You're probably overpaid then, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I expect so. Yeah, yeah. I'm terrible at negotiating. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Uh, Jim, Jim's, Jim's a sales guy. And uh, you know, a sales guy. That's a that that's, that comes with a lot of respect. He's one of the best best in the business. But geez, he's a bad buyer. Yeah, yeah. that's very true. Very true. <laughs> so so let, let's talk about buying property, Rob. You're an investor. You've got a couple of properties under your belt. You you, you want to do it yourself. You don't want to use a buyer's agent. Fair enough. That's cool. If you've got the time, or inclination, or or the appetite to do it. Me personally, I don't want to spend all my weekend going through open houses. Don't want to do it. Someone else can do it. But say say if I want to go down that path and I go, all right, I'm going to buy my next property. I've located an area, which is. You know, this 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 bracket might be you know uh, within five kilometres of CBD and you know the North Shore of Sydney, where, wherever it is. You know, within a price point, I've done all those sort of stuff. Okay, I know how much money I've got to spend. I've got a pre-approval. I'm ready to buy. I flick through realestate.com every night when I'm sitting there watching the TV, and I find all these great properties that I think are a really good buy, but I want to go get a cheaper price. What do I do next? I suppose just research hard. So the area that you're looking in, if you're on realestate.com and things like that, you can qualify a lot through online or by making an inquiry with the agent. And what I mean by that is you've found the area, you know, there might be 15 properties in there. If you're looking at those properties and you're looking through the photographs closely, you might see that through the living room there's an apartment block directly opposite. Well, if you wanted a bit of an outlook, you can discount that straight away. Um, if you're calling the agent, he's telling you it's a quiet street, you know, look on Google Maps, you might see that it's backing onto military road. The front of it might be quiet, but the back of it's military road. So you can qualify a lot. So do your research. Once you've done that, you've narrowed down properties that, that, that you want to go look at. Get out there, view as many as you can, get to know the area. Use realestate.com if you don't have the tools like APM, 
RP data to determine value. I think with realestate.com you can go into the sold sections um, and you can get a fair idea of, of values fairly quickly. Also, if you're going out there actively, which I recommend if you're looking to buy, be out there every week, you might catch that bargain, you're going to get an understanding of values pretty quickly. Attend a few auctions if you're a bit of a novice, you know, they, they can be quite daunting if you're going to do your first one. So go and see what's going on in the market. Once you've done that, knowledge is power not only with the research that you've done and the preparation, but also when it comes to the negotiating. What I mean by that is where are the owners going? Why are they selling? Do they need a long settlement? Do they need a shorter settlement? Are they happy with a 5% deposit? Things like that. The more you know about the negotiation, the better you are and better prepared you can be to go in and negotiate a good price. So for example, if the owners are downsizing and they're building a villa out the central coast and they need a three month settlement, and you know that, that can help you get a better price. And I had that situation with an apartment in, in Greenwich. They were downsizing to a villa, they had a huge apartment there. There was an offer above us at $70,000. That buyer wanted to settle within six weeks. Obviously we were 70 k less, but I knew they needed time to finish their villa up the coast. We gave them the settlement period, they took our offer. So knowledge is power. But how do you get that information? Because Asians are cagey, all right? And, um so say I've got these properties, I've, I've gone through, I've, I've done what you've just said, you know, I've looked through all the pictures, I've tried to sniff out what's good, what's not good, get the real life, might go on the ground, have a look around. How do agents want you to connect with them? Do they? Because, you know, you can fill out a contact form on, on, on realestate.com, whatever, and say, hi, I'm interested in this. Then you expect a phone call from an agent. Are you better off doing that, waiting for an agent to call you, or are you better off getting on the front foot, finding the agent's number and calling him up? What, what, what do you do? Which one? Absolutely on the front foot. So the thing is, and you're right, you can't just come out and, and hammer the agent straight away. He's just going to close up if they're good at what they do. They won't tell you anything. But the thing is, is that if you're out there actively looking, it's usually the top agents that have the best listings. So it's, it's important for you to build rapport with them. Build a bit of trust. You're calling them every week. You're emailing them every week. It's easy for me because I've been in the industry so long. What I'm saying is you build the rapport with the agent, get them to know you. They know that you're serious. They're going to tell you a little bit more. It's almost like the, when it comes down to the power of investment. So the more time that you spend with them, the more time that they spend with you, that equates to dollar value. So if they're taking you to open homes, private appointments, things like that, they're going to they're going to want to sell out of you. Mm. And then when you throw in that low ball low offer, they're going to go, oh shit, low Rob but I've put in so many hours, they're going to work a little bit harder to try and get it over the line. And I'll just finish on that note. When you're doing the questions, it's got to be nonchalant. You can't come in hard straight off the bat. And so it might be things like, okay, so what's the land size? What's the strata? And then lead into, oh, why are the owner selling? Mm. So, you know, so there's a way of... And you can of, do that in the first phone call? You can do it you phone call, it. you can do it at the, at the open. It's, yeah, it's the way you get around to, to getting into those questions. The thing is, that what, what, what I find is that you do it innately because that's what you do for a living. To me, it's quite an innate thing as well. I can, very fluid in the way I can, I can you know, steer a conversation and I'm quite good at it. Jimbo, you're the same on, on, on a sales side. But, you know, but if I am not used to negotiating, haggling with people. So I, I want to do a role play. You be an agent, I'll be an investor right so i go okay um i want to buy this property here i call up and go oh hi uh it's phil here i'm i'm interested in uh the property at 216 smith street in smithfield how much is it is that what people would do like normally <laughs> do, yeah. and, and so, yeah, so how, what yeah. would an agent say oh look basis? nowadays it, depending on the area if, if you're buying in the areas that we're working in a lot of the responses are nowadays because of the new laws about prices are, oh, look, we don't really give price guides, but I'm going to send you a list of comparable sales to this property and you can have a look at that and make up your own mind. Sometimes the response is, it's our first open this weekend. Uh, we're not really sure of the price at this stage. We want to get some feedback from the buyers and then we'll let you know. So then, yeah, I just pretty much will ask a few questions before I lead into the price question. Nonchalant the way that you, you ask the questions. But if they come back with that response about waiting for interest and, and you know, we'll send you a list of comparables, I usually just come back to them and, and say, look, we've got a few opens around that that sort of time i just don't want to waste your time and my time i just want to know roughly are we in the you know what would the price be in a range and normally they're forthcoming and they'll say okay well the property's going to be around 1 to 1.1 when i buy anything whether it's a you know roll of kitchen paper or, or or a business i want them to give me the price rather than me giving them the price i'm willing to pay for something and that's just 
historically the way I've always bought and the way I like it to be. I like to, you know, they can put a number out and it might be so far out you just go, that's just ridiculous and walk away or it's just going to give you some – so you just get some information. Do you think agents are hesitant to to give a number purely because they think, well, if I throw out a big bait and, you know, I might get a big fish to bite it and pay well over the odds of what the thing's worth? Is that is that their mindset, agents typically? No, they're typically their, their mindset is quite at low. That, that, you know, especially with the older agents, they've been taught through the years, quote it low, watch it go, quote it high, watch it die. So a lot of the figures that they'll actually give the buyers will be very enticing. People get financially involved by doing strata reports, building and pest inspections. Uh, they get emotionally vo- involved when they go back two or three times, they take mum and dad or they take the kids. Once they've roped the people in, after two or three weeks you might see the price start to the price guides start to rise. Sometimes it'll just keep it very low. Come auction day, you know, the starting bid from another buyer is basically what they were quoting. <laughs> so, so we're in, you know, we, we write about a lot, this a lot in our, our publications, Jim. Um, it's a pretty hot market in certain parts of Australia. You know, auction results have been pretty strong the last couple of weeks slash months, despite some uncertainty with, you know, the, the recent election and all that sort of stuff. The market's still pretty bullish and, you know, we see that. What's your sort of take, Jim, on not buying or negotiating in like a hot market where, you know, traditionally, if you look at the city market, for example, or, or even Brizzy, there's a lot of activity, a lot of stuff going on. Um, what have you seen people do well in in hot markets? You know, is that is that is that something you think uh, people are, are, are well versed to negotiate in those type of situations? From an from my own point of view, in terms of if we're talking for investors, investors. Uh, Look, I think if it's investment property, you're not going to live in it. So my number one thing would be just do not get emotionally attached to that property. Just do the figures. You know, if you lose out, work out what you're prepared to pay for it. Work out your cash flow. Do your analysis on it. Work out what you might have to put in each week or each month. Or if it's going to be cash flow positive, then that's great. Set your figures. And if it goes past that, walk away from it. There'll be another property. If it's a hot market, there's properties on the market. It, it's a business as far as I'm concerned. If you're looking for your own home, then that's a different matter altogether. It depends how far you're prepared to stretch your budget for, for the right property that you want to live in. So, yeah. The, 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 the dream. And, and Don't get attached to any properties if it's an as investor. investor. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with you. It's great. So, so, Rob, how do you know when you throw a couple of numbers let's say you throw a whole bunch of offers out on properties how do you know when you've got a hook how do you know when you know the number you've given appeals to the agent or it strikes at a time where you know if a property's been on the market a long time and they need to shift it you know what what, what are the telltale, t- telltale factors you know when you go this is it this this deal's going to happen oh look you can usually tell that within your sort of third to fourth offer you know if they're talking to you after your third offer and, and coming back to you with a counter offer you've got them okay that's a good point so so if you throw out an offer and they give you a counter offer, you know you're you're in the game. If you you're throw out an offer and you don't hear anything back from them, you're probably a bit far away. They're probably working on other counter offers somewhere else. Absolutely, and and in the, and in this game of negotiation, that's what you want. You want you want a counter offer. You know that that's what I work on. And and what we do when we look at a property and what the client's interested in, we'll run a series of three to four offers. The first one being low. low. That, that's the first rule of negotiation. Always start low to the point of being almost insulting. Now, the agent's going to jump up and down and everything else. Who cares? The beauty of having sort of me as a buffer, I can say, well, my client Jimbo here, he wanted to start a lot lower. You're lucky. Don't shoot the messenger. Then they sort of like calm down a bit. Our second offer, so that's normally a no, but the reason why I do it is because you never know someone might turn around and go, hey, we'll take the offer. You don't know what the motivation is on the owner's side if they're in debt need money for a business, whatever. So our second offer is usually a little bit more serious. And at the second offer, I'm really pushing hard for a counter offer from from the vendor. So put in our second offer, they come back and go, Rob, look, thanks, no thanks. However, the owner will take this this amount. Now in the background, we're doing our due diligence, right? So the finance is being arranged, contracts being perused, inspections are being done. Our third offer, we go in with the form of signed contract. Unconditional. And it's less than what the counter offer is. And it sometimes, you know, depending on the price range, it could be fifty to one hundred thousand. So you'll ask them for the, the the sales contract, and you'll actually give them a written offer on that contract and say, "Here's the contract signed, unconditional, unconditional section sixty six W deposit and everything." So, for example, let's just talk figures. 
They've counter-offered at 700000 We might go in with a contract at 665 750 Do odd amounts, because odd amounts sends a message that you're throwing every last dollar out. You might do 77 Nightmare for stamp duty, but it's funny when people see that, they go, oh shit, they've really chucked every dollar at it. Anyway, coming back to what I'm saying, so you might put in your offer at that figure, but at that figure it's in the form of a signed contract, unconditional. Now if it's been on the market for a long time, number one, the agent looks at it, you, you can see the dollar signs light up in yeah. his eyes. Burn He's thinking commission, yeah. burn in the hand. He takes it to the owner, works every time, or nine times out of ten. Powerful. And you know what? If they don't take it, they'll counter offer then again. You've got the contract there, you do the deal. Mm. So either way, it's a win-win. So it's a good way to speed up the, the actual process to a sale. Absolutely. And it shows that you're probably serious as well. If he's got other punters sort of... You know, I imagine an agent's probably trying to get so many bidders at, at, simultaneously. If you've got three or four guys on the go, if you get a signed offer, bang. But but I would say... Well, I tell you, they almost forget about them. Just but, because but, they know someone might put in a verbal offer, yeah. right? But it's only a verbal offer. I'm going with the guy who's got the bird in the hand. I don't care if it's another five grand. They haven't done their building and pairs. They haven't got their finance. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a powerful, powerful tool. But do they use that against you, though? So if the cynic in me would say, okay, I'm an agent and using your scenario, I've got a, a written offer for you know 30 odd grand below where the negotiation was wouldn't he just take that to one of the other bidders and go i've actually got this signed contract for this much you do five more grand and it's yours number does one he's happen? invading privacy if he does do that okay you know i'm not so saying that they, they don't because do you're okay. right people yeah. will probably go do that but it is pretty illegal to take someone's offer and go present it to another buyer you know your personal details and everything else can't stop someone from doing that yeah. however you can mitigate that by perhaps saying here's the offer it's only valid till six o'clock tonight i'll be back to pick up the contract so if he's ringing around trying to, you know, store things or get other buyers in, he knows he's only got a two-hour window. How hard is he really going to push it? He might, and there has been circumstances where other people have performed and we've been gazumped, you know, that's happened. But most times when you put the deadline in, the deal's, the deal's done within that time frame. Okay, so that's good. So, so what I take from this conversation would be written offer is a, is a, a powerful tool because it shows you're, you're ready to do the deal. The second one, give it a time window. And, and really, it's just a phone call. The, the, the agent just needs to speak to the vendor and say, got a deal here, do you want it? You can give them 30 minutes if you really wanted to. Say, this is my offer, take it or leave it. And then if they don't come back to you, you know there's other people and participants in the game. And that gives you greater intelligence to know maybe your offer is too low and you can always go back and revise. You can always go up. You know, Absolutely. you can always go up. Uh, okay, that, that's, that's, that's really Rob, I might, I might just say, I wouldn't mind just getting, uh, just getting your thoughts on using a buyer's agent when it comes to the actual auction process particularly in the Sydney market. Auctions seem to be the norm at the moment. I know that, that you know, not, not quite as, as high percentage-wise as, as they were a while ago, but still a lot of properties in Sydney obviously go to, go to auction. What, what's the value for, as a property investor, to, to use someone like yourself? Oh, look, I suppose, you know, coming back to what I said before, if people are only buying at auction once every seven or ten years, I think the stats are, and it's their biggest financial decision and one of their biggest emotional decisions, it, going, to, going to an auction is enormous duress, you know, and that's, I suppose, why they love to have auctions because they want to put you in that environment, hundreds of people around, agents circling like sharks, auctioneers screaming at you, you're making this big decision. And I've seen, you know, I've been there with doctors, lawyers, you know, barristers, and I've seen them crumble in an auction environment because it is stressful. So I suppose if you're not doing it every week, Hire someone that will just take all that stress away, all that emotion. They can be at the auction with you, standing ne next to you, and just let the professional do, do the bidding. With having a professional, we know when to bid, when not to bid, when to slow it up in terms of its increments. I, I negotiate while the auction's going all the time. You know, So what I mean by that is is when they call for an opening bid or offer, you're normally an auction's very, very silent. I'll kick it off very low. And, and usually the auctioneers are, are quite happy to take it because it gets things going. So we'll take the bid. At that point, I'll, I'll pull out. The competition will start bidding. I might challenge the auctioneer, you know, during that process. Mr. Auctioneer, have you re reached a reserve yet? No, we haven't. If buyers know that, sometimes it helps slow the bidding down a bit more. Um, if I'm not challenging the auctioneer, I'm talking to the agent. Have we reached a reserve? This is, you know, while it's going, I'll pull them aside. Have reached a reserve? No, no, no. If the auction become stagnant in stalls, which does at a period of time sometimes, and it's not on the market, I'll normally say, when the agent says to me, well, look, the reserve is 1.7, I might say to him, well, look, I'll give you 1670 if you put it on the market. So we're negotiating while it's going on, and this happens a lot. Then he'll go inside to get the auction on the market and to be sold, which is his goal. He'll go and talk to the owners. The owners go, yep, 
auction stalled, we'll take his bid, hopefully it might spur things on. So they, they put on the market 30 grand less than their reserve and, and you know we go from there. And that's normally when I become a little bit more aggressive once I know that it's on the market. Some cases um, we, we end up being the highest bid. You know, the auction's stagnant already, our extra 10 or 15 gets the property. Interesting that you negotiate with the agents while the auction's in play. So there's two ways you could, if you, you want to know what the on market price is, right? There's two ways you could play. You can either go, you want to be the highest bidder when it's on the market, so you get the property, or you want to be, if it doesn't hit on the market price, you want to be the highest bidder because it gives you the right to negotiate if it gets passed in. Yeah. So just, just on that, that point, it's a good one. It's, it's something that the market's uh, made people believe that you have to be the highest bidder to negotiate. It's not a law. Right, so you don't have to be the highest bid. If you want, you can just pull out, get it passed in. They are still going to come and talk to you as one of the bidders, and 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 and, and you'll have a chance at buying the property. They, it's just something that they've sort of yeah, it's I sort suppose, of an urban myth. Well, I think it it's is. more of a you know why to keep people bidding. Yeah. It's to keep people bidding. That, that's the only reason. So if you're miles away from the reserve, what I'm saying to the listeners is don't be afraid to get it passed in. Okay, so say say a property's passed in, it might be. Miles, you never know why it probably gets passed. You know, sometimes property on this Saturday, if you sell on the next Saturday, it might go for another five hundred thousand dollars. You just never know, right? So, so if you're bidding on an auction and it gets passed in, what should you go up to the agent and go? I'm still interested in this. Uh, let's have a chat. Is he going to go? Well, I need to speak to to Billy Smith over here first, or is he going to try and get everyone to give a, a silent offer and wait up and go? We'll go with you. A good agent, right? who's working for the owner and his job is to get the best price will talk to every buyer, every person that's put in a bid. Yep, they will. You might get someone who's a little bit new to the industry or a little bit arrogant. He'll go, oh, we're just going to talk to the highest bidder. Like, he's doing the wrong thing. And, it, and it's as I said, it's not a law that, that the highest bidder gets the first right to negotiate. It might be a company policy. That would be fair enough if they word it that way. But other than that, it does not give that person the first right to the property. Interesting. But yeah, it's not, a, it's not a law. That. Oh. Yeah, well, there you go. You know, Put it in your little tool chest of uh, auction tactics, Jim. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Now, coming back to, to the market being as bullish as it is with auctions, a lot of people, you know, in the areas that we buy here, they say, well, Rob, you know, the agent's saying to us it's going all the way to auction. They're not taking off as prior. That's a myth too, you know, like in terms of they're not the ones that make the decision, the owners are, right? And I've found through, through the years that I've been doing it, coming up to 16 years of buying property as a buyer's agent outside of my personal purchases over the years, is that if an owner receives a fair offer, they will sell prior to auction. And time and time again with properties that I've gone to and they're telling everyone we're going to auction, we've bought the property prior. Is it right, Rob, that if you make an offer as a, uh, as a potential buyer, the agent has to deliver that offer to the, to the vendor? Absolutely. Yeah, by law, he has to. Doesn't happen all the time. If you're worried about that, put it in writing and request it back in writing. As an owner or vendor or using a real estate agent, is it cheaper for me to sell my property by private treaty or is it cheaper for me to go to auction? I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of if, if you put an offer in prior to auction, is, is there any sort of mathematical, you know, equation that someone would use and go, if I take it to auction, there's a potential that it won't sell and therefore I'm going to have to remarket it and go through a longer process. Or if I just take this, it might be slightly below what my agent has told me the place worth, but again, bird in hand, take it off the market. Is there a, is there a cost factor associated with it that ever comes into play? Not necessarily, no, because you've already been on the market. Most of the campaign's paid for. The actual auctioneer's fee is about $500, so it doesn't really matter. But it just comes back to what you said then. Yeah, people are a little bit nervous about auction day, just like buyers are. Sellers are nervous about it too. So I find if the offer that they get prior to auction, if it enables them to, to go and do what they need to do, they're going to take the offer. And, and there, there is a... <clears throat> I know that agents use the terminology around it, but a property that's been on the market for a long time essentially becomes a dog and then is really, really hard to sell. So if you're selling a property, there's a, a really tight window of, you know, probably three or three or so weeks, a month, maybe a bit longer where the property's hot, it's new, and that's when you're going to get all the interest and you need to flog it in that period of time. When you're assessing properties, do you go looking for those ones that you know have been on the market for a long time and use that as a, as a way in which to... to 
build your intelligence around it and, and come in with real low ball offers? Is that a, a, a factor that you look at? So for an investment side, yes, if we can get a, a good bargain and, and the property meets what our clients are looking for. If it's for a home occupier that, that likes a home, yeah, absolutely. We know that we're going to get it for a good price because of the fact it's been on the market for so long. Mm. And you, you watch these shows on TV, um, Selling Houses. Uh, Selling Houses Australia. Australia. Which is pretty much, I've watched a couple of times, so a house which is something not fundamentally wrong with it but just needs a, a tart up, right? And they transform it and they flog it for a whole bunch more. Is that the stuff that you look for, those properties that your average emotional buyer can't see the wood through the trees on but – um, you know, they, they sometimes spend ten grand on a, a place or fifteen grand on a place, and they completely transform it and get another seventy, eighty thousand bucks at auction. How, how do you, as a buyer, as an investor, how do you see that that potential if if you not really wired that way? Is that hard? Yeah, yeah, it is hard. Uh, um, you know, certainly, I think for for buyers, for, for me, because I've looked at a lot of homes, I can sort of see through that. You know, homes are just staged. They say. Sterile and generic, almost, you know. But the good thing is now the interior designers are becoming very savvy and and making homes look so personal, that, like they're being lived in. Um, but yeah, no, certainly it can it can be hard for a lot of buyers to see th- see through that. Yeah, no, no. It's all right, well, mate. We're running out of time, Rob. But um, just to finish up, um, can you give me your your the, the three biggest tricks agents use in a sort of buying negotiation process that you need to be aware of? Okay, um, I suppose the big one is is that if you're interested in a home and you want to place an offer and you place an offer, that the comeback line for nearly every property is, we've received a higher one. So that seems to be you know one of the tricks they like to play. How do you know? Look, it's really hard to, to, to decipher, you know. Um, so that'd probably be one. Number two would be qualifying the properties because you'll call them and 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 they'll tell you certain things, oh, there's no stairs or anything else, but then you find out there are. So coming back to what I said earlier, really qualify online, look at the pictures closely, look at the floor plan, look at Google Maps, get an idea. Because, you know, time's important nowadays, and and you want to get to the right home. And with most open homes being open between 11 and 1, if you go look at that particular home and it's not the right one, you might have missed out on the one that, that that's your perfect home. So qualify well. Number three, I would say... Put all offers once you've done your due diligence in writing to get a bit to get a better price. And that's how you can sort of. I, I like agents, like dealing with agents. We do a lot of work with agents, um, and, and we're very fortunate in Australia that we have some exceptional agents as as vendors um, who you can use to to sell your property, whether it's an investment property or a home. But uh, as a buyer, I like to have all the advantages possible to me to be able to uh, uh, influence the price. In a downwards direction, so yes. uh, yeah, that's, that's all, all investors try. To Rob, do. I think one of the, one of the one of the great tools for an investor, and one of the things you mentioned about you know doing your research, getting you know the the best idea you can about the, the the price or the value of the property. You mentioned the likes of RP Data and APM Price Finder. Perhaps for our listeners, you can just give them a. A bit of an idea uh, for those that aren't familiar with those um, those sources of property data. They're incredibly uh, incredibly valuable. I found perhaps you can give the guys, the girls a bit of a, a bit more info on on those. Yeah, look, the great thing about about those databases is is that you can break down exactly the sort of properties that are similar to the one that you're looking at in the last six months in the immediate area. You can look at their sale prices, and the good thing about the database is that you can go into their into their their links and look at the photographs, floor plans, and you can really compare apples with apples in terms of pricing a property. I believe RP Data is the database that all the valuers of the major banks use. And you can run a price estimate on a property. So, you know, if you're looking at that and you run a price estimate and it brings up the price, you, you can be pretty much sure that you're Right, the mortgage broker, when you guys do the val, it's going to come in and around the same sort of money, around the same amount. So that gives you confidence. If you don't have, um, if you're not subscribing to them because some of them are quite costly, you know, especially if you go for a th- three or four properties that, and you've missed out, um, it can be quite costly. Then just go into the, the tools and look up the sold section on realestate.com. They're very informative and you can pull up a map of all the immediate sales in that particular area. Of similar accommodation. So if you're looking at a two bedroom apartment parking, you can you can break that down and see the recent sales, which is fabulous. And as I said, go out to as many auctions, as many opens, track the sale figures, and you'll have within two months a great idea on value. Something you mentioned, Jimbo, you you see 
property investment as a business and that's the, the way I see the world and uh, you don't get emotionally attached with it. What you're saying about, you know, comparables, you know, prices, etc. Property is a commodity. You know, there, there is not a, a, a flat on this street uh, in this suburb probably isn't going to be that much different from a flat in the same suburb on a slightly different street if it has all the same components, the same size, floor plan, two bedrooms, parking spot, et cetera, et cetera. So you're not going to get a bargain if the price or the market says that something is worth about this. You might get a little bit of fluctuation either way. What I've seen a lot of buyers do is that they think, no, 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 I'm going to try and put really low ball it because you never know what's happening. And I think that's a good strategy. But a property is a commodity. So if you can use these tools like RB data to actually establish what the price is, start around there at least or a little bit lower. But you know where it's going to end up because it's not going to fluctuate too much, particularly in a buoyant market. Yeah, good point. That's probably what I'd summarise on. But uh, Rob, mate, really really enjoyed you coming in. Um, yeah, appreciate the insights. Uh, we, we like to fly the flag for for buyers agents, for guys like me and Jim who are time poor and um, busy doing other things. Um, you know, we're, we're massive advocates for using using specialists to do stuff, whether it's a buyers agent or whether it's a mortgage broker or other people. Um, if, if if our listeners aren't using buyers agents, that's cool. But um, if if you find yourself in those similar situations and you're looking to grow your portfolio rapidly, aggressively, you know, it might be worth having a chat. There's some exceptional buyers agents around town as well, you know, all over Australia. So check it out. They all do different things. Um, and charge you different prices, but um, you know, go out and assess the marketplaces. Jimbo, thanks for joining no us. No problem. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo that. I think you know, one of the first things I learned when I first started in, uh, in in property investment was surround yourself with people that know more about the game than you do, and uh, that's what I, that's what I've done. I mean, I've learned a lot along the way, but uh, the people that I use to help support my uh, my investment property portfolio and building that buyers agents get yourself a good mortgage broker do a lot of reading listen to people hear to hear from people that have that have done there and walk the walk uh, yeah before we close of off what's your favorite um uh, property investment uh, book uh well it's probably probably one that quite a few people have read i think uh, jan summers more wealth through property uh investment i think it's called uh, the jan summers book that is a classic book there's also another good one um the richest man in babylon okay it's well worth worth reading as well uh look it up if you haven't read it that's good and i know that you read smartpropertyinvestment.com.au every single day <laughs> daily and i listen to the podcast <laughs> each week without fail <laughs> just on that note guys uh check out the website uh, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au uh everything you need to know is there uh insights opinions uh from guys like Robert and other other professionals in the market, but also um, a lot of investor stories. Um, I also share our portfolio and what we're doing in that regard. Uh, check it out. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can follow me uh, on Twitter at Philip Tarrant. Uh, if you want to ask me any questions or uh, get any particular guests on the show, if you want to come on yourself, uh, email me at uh, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. I uh, will see you again next week. Bye-bye.